Hello, everybody, and uh, this is Congressman Paul Mitchell. Uh, thanks for joining uh, our telephone town hall today. If you uh, hold on, please, uh, we're going to talk a little bit today and provide you an update on uh, the coronavirus uh, assistance available through federal resources. Uh, if you just hold on, we want to get as many people in as possible. We're dialing uh, just about uh, almost 230,000 phone numbers we have. So if you're a little patient and hold on, we'll start the official part of the call in a moment. Uh, share resources with you and how you can access those. Hosts. Again, uh, this is Congressman Paul Mitchell, and uh, we're trying to uh, reach out to everyone in the community and provide some uh, assistance in terms of uh, what federal programs can help in the midst of uh, this uh, pandemic, uh, which I think is the only name for it at this point in time. So a little patience would be appreciated as we reach more people. Uh, we got a big dial to do here, and we'll try not to repeat things multiple times. Uh, we are given the the numerous programs we have to cover today, the amount of information, uh, and the number of people we're calling, to be honest with you. We're not going to do uh, questions today on online. This will be a listen-only call. We will have the opportunity as you go along. Uh, I'll answer frequently asked questions that constituents have provided to us. Additionally, we will uh, have all this information will be available on the website, on my website, at mitchell.house.gov. You'll be able to access that information and uh, Go from there to various links that I think will uh, will assist you as you uh, look at the um, uh, services that are available. We're still dialing, and uh, it will take us a little bit of time to dial. So uh, if you want, put it on speaker and just listen for a few moments as we wait to get as many people on the call as possible and help as many people today. Uh, it's important information, I think, will help them between what's available from the federal government and state government in terms of uh, services for uh, to assist with the coronavirus. So I uh, appreciate you uh, joining, and hopefully uh, if you have questions, again, you can access our website after the call at mitchell.house.gov. See if information is available there on the links. We've got a lot of frequently asked questions there. If not, send an email with your question. I would ask you, if you would, provide an email for us to respond. As uh, To be honest with you, uh, if you send it, we are, we're not able to do uh, hard letters right now. It's simply uh, not possible to do. Uh, given that we're working remotely as well. And uh, if you've been watching, uh, Washington, D.C. and Virginia also has stay-at-home orders now. Let me uh, start a little bit. We do have a few thousand people on the call, and we'll repeat some things so that we can uh, keep things moving. Uh, again, this call is to provide information to uh, everyone in the district here. Uh, I'm the congressman for uh, northern Macomb County and all through the thumb, so assuming you live there or your phone number is there, then, in fact, you're, that's why you're on this call today. On this call, I want to talk about the coronavirus pandemic and federal programs in response to it. We're not going to do another discussion of all the medical information, all of that. You'll see, you'll see that on all of the TV newscasts, all the uh, updates from both the president, the task force, from uh, the mayor of uh, uh, from Governor Cuomo in New York, uh, from Mayor Whit Governor Whitmer. You'll see all that multiple times, so I'm not going to rehash that. The purpose of this is to talk about efforts we've taken at the federal level to provide support for everyone, for all of you, to, during this coronavirus challenge. So far, we've passed uh, three pieces of legislation to assist with this and respond to this challenge. Let me give you a little update on those in more detail on something called the CARES Act. An emergency spending bill was passed on March 6th uh, to provide additional support for, um, and we'll get into that, uh, financial support for uh, preparation for the coronavirus issue. Additionally, we signed the, first, uh, the Families First Corona Response Act on March 18th, and then the CARES Act, which was, which you've heard a lot about, the $2 trillion program that was put in place on March 27th that we all went back to Washington to pass. We have numerous federal and state agencies working 24-7 every day of the week. Uh, I'm on calls with most of them all through the week, including the weekend. Federal agencies include FEMA, the Federal Emergency Management Agency, the, uh, the Center for Disease Control, the Army Corps of Engineers, Health and Human Services, Housing and Urban Development, Department of Labor. They are all involved in one way or another in responding to this and assisting on this issue. Sorry, let me respond. Let me provide a little detail on the three bills that have passed. First, let me tell people who joined the call a little later, and I appreciate everyone joining, that uh, this is intended to provide assistance for folks in terms of linkages for services and assistance available in dealing with coronavirus from the federal level. 
Uh, this call is listen only. If you have questions after the call, please go to mitchell.house.gov. You'll find uh, links to the uh, uh, various uh, programs as well as frequently asked questions, and you can send an email to us with questions. Federal legislation so far. Let me get into those. First, in, on March 6th, we passed what's called an emergency supplemental bill. Provide a little more than $8 billion to expand, replenish health-related reserve, and provide for uh, assistance in developing and purchasing essential equipment and supplies. Uh, they've been doing that. They've been buying supplies. To be absolutely honest with you, uh, the strategic national stockpile was never designed to handle a uh, national pandemic. It was designed to handle uh, regional just with regional uh, disasters, and um, we uh, wasn't designed to handle a nationwide problem of this scale. It simply wasn't, and they're scrambling. And I would, you know, I, we could have all discussions whether we started late. We probably did, frankly. Uh, we probably did because we didn't have clear information from China what was going on there. It was missed by uh, a lot of people or underestimated, let's put it that way, rather than missed. Uh, even if we caught it early, um, there isn't enough supply chain in the world to deal with the extent of PPE and equipment we need besides make, doing what we're doing right now. And uh, they're working hard at it. The federal government, FEMA, the governor, members of Congress trying to reach out and see what we can do to persist with uh, protective equipment for everyone, and particularly first responders, as well as uh, working on therapeutic drugs and vaccines. And both of those therapeutic drugs and vaccines are moving at literally record pace. We can talk about that a little later. The second bill that passed was the Families First Coronavirus Response Act. That was uh, one of the more important pieces, and it provided $1.2 billion, among other things, for COVID testing to provide to ensure that testing is covered for everyone, regardless of their insurance status, regardless of cost, and to provide that testing as well as enhancing unemployment insurance. That passed on March 18th. That was a smaller bill. Again, doing this in phases. What they call Phase 3, or the CARES Act, is a larger bill. that passed on March 27th, the House, and was signed by the President that day. It's a $2 trillion bill, and you've heard a lot about it on TV. You've seen it in the news. And what it, uh, what it frankly does is uh, tries to deal with things in, in three different components. What does it do for communities and for health, for the health system, which is challenged. We all see that on TV. I visited with McLaren and McComb yesterday. They uh, asked me to come down and see them. I went through their, their operations, their COVID operations, and spent a couple of hours with them looking at the problems they have there. And they're meaningful. I will not underestimate them. They truly are. And they're working hard. The healthcare professionals, if, uh, you know them, thank them, because uh, it's a tough job. Uh, I talked with a, a case manager yesterday that uh, day before she had held the hand of and sat with uh, four patients that passed away that day. Um, that's a tough day for anybody. They passed away without their family. This is not something we, uh, we, we need to recognize the contribution of our uh, first responders, our health workers, and we'll talk a little bit more about some of the things I think we need to do about that shortly. What the CARES, CARES Act does, let's get into that a little bit and talk more about what that means. First, I want to stress all this is dependent upon following some of the guidelines we got from CDC at the beginning of the month in the middle of, in the middle of March. First and foremost, let's fact, focus on what they call social distancing, I call physical distancing. That is to leave about six feet between you and, and people you don't routinely spend time in. Now, not your family, not your spouse and your kids, although there are days you may want to leave a little more space, uh, but uh, uh, to leave physical distancing. The objective is to avoid transmission of the virus to other people. And what we found is that there's a fair number of people that have uh, the coronavirus and don't have symptoms. You may not know if someone's ill. They may not know they're ill, but they have the virus and they're transmitting it. It's simple, but it can't be overstated. The objective, as I say, is to flatten the curve. And to flatten the curve means spread out the transmission of the virus and uh, over a period of time so the health system can absorb this. I've been asked by staff, by the way, to re-announce that uh, uh, this is your congressman, Paul Mitchell, a congressman for Northern Macomb County of the Thumb, and I'm trying to provide everyone an update on the coronavirus services and assistance and objectives of the federal government as we try to help communities and states deal with this problem. The other thing I want to be clear on is, is the guidance that the CDC issued in terms of hand washing, 
in terms of uh, not exposing yourself unnecessarily to staying. Only go out for urgent things you need to do, the things that require you. Go get your food, your medications. But uh, you know, let's, let's avoid some of the things that were going on for a while. You saw the photos or the video of people having little block parties because, they, hey, they were out of school or out of work or uh, the, the spring break stuff down in Florida. Let's, let's avoid those things. Uh, that's what the, was the objective because uh, they certainly can transmit the virus and we will overwhelm the health system even more than it is now. Let's talk a little bit about the health care provisions that we've moved forward to try to assist in protecting the health of all Americans. The Phase 2 bill allocated $1.2 billion for free COVID testing. I've been asked about that. COVID testing should be available free of charge. Now, part of it may be covered by insurance, but what it said, it would clarify it also is that COVID testing must be covered by private insurance without cost sharing. If you don't have any private, any version of insurance whatsoever, the federal government will pay for it to health care providers. We can't have people afraid to be tested because they can't get access to their uh, – uh, because they're afraid of the cost of testing. It also provided about $27 billion for developing vaccines and medication to deal with uh, the coronavirus. What's happened is we've already got a number of medications that are being tested. We have, uh, I think we just saw the second, go into, the second vaccine go into some, uh, some testing. Uh, it will take time to get a vaccine. It's, uh, to get one turned around even in a year would be nearly astronomical, but that's what they're working on, to have a vaccine available in the foreseeable future. Uh, so, in fact, we can deal with this. We, um, in terms of medical supplies, to put additional money into medical supplies, we put $16 billion to try to keep up with, to try to replenish the cis states like Michigan. Uh, let's be honest, we have a challenge here. Uh, with the necessary personal protective equipment, gloves, masks, visors, what they call bunny suits, in order to make sure that they can effectively treat uh, patients. We also have to recognize that the supply chain in the United States was challenged, that we didn't have enough providers in the United States building that. And that's a long-term issue that we're going to have to deal with in order to prepare for pandemics and challenges in the future. Uh, I will be one of those who say, frankly, we need to fix our supply chain and our dependence on uh, providers outside the United States, particularly in China and overseas, that uh, create some real challenges for us in time of crisis. And, and it has. And to be frankly, uh, they're not helping much. We also provided for assistance for the health insurance agencies so that uh, health hospitals had $100 billion to disseminate and HHS, Health and Human Services, in the process of doing that so that, in fact, uh, we can assist hospitals with the extraordinary costs of treating, preparing for, and treating uh, patients. Um, we are, uh, many hospitals, they've totally stopped serving anything other than emergency or immediate needs and COVID testing. I was at one of them yesterday, and their entire floors are empty that they're repurposing and re-equipping to deal with COVID. There are some real costs involved in that. Now, let me stop here and say that the other thing we need to deal with is some support for our health care providers, for the front line. Uh, I signed on to a bill that I'm going to push very hard, I think has potential, which will provide for uh, tax relief, a tax exemption from federal taxes for uh, first responders, nurses, personnel working in a hospital, dietary personnel, all of them. Uh, police officers fire EMTs from federal taxes for four to six months. We're working on it now. There's a bill in this bill proposed. I think we need to do something that's uniform to say thank you to those folks. Uh, and the best thing we can do is simply take away their federal tax bill for a while. So uh, we're, we're going to work on that and see if we can move that forward. I'll continue going in terms of other resources that are available. But first, let me stop here for a second and uh, remind people that we're trying to provide a uh, compact and concise uh, update on the federal assistance to deal with coronavirus. Uh, it, it will be a call that's only a, I'm going to talk to you, uh, no questions today, uh, because we're dialing a couple of hundred thousand people, and uh, we're also uh, trying to get a lot of information out. If you go to the website for additional information at mitchell.house.gov, you can link to various programs, frequently asked questions, and if you have a question from there, send us an email. Let me talk a little bit about provisions for uh, in individuals that are in the, uh, in the program. First is you've heard a lot about it. Uh, they call it cash payments for individuals. They call it a variety of things. The bill calls it economic impact payments. And they are literally cash payments to individuals uh, 
based upon their, their we're limited by their income. Uh, some of the, most anybody that files a tax return will be getting them. I'll talk about the eligibility, but the other is that they uh, they'll go into other industries who haven't filed taxes. We'll tell you how to do that. A couple of questions we've had about these these payments, these direct payments. First, how big are the payments? Is one of the questions we've had. Taxpayers uh, will, will be determined based on either 2019 taxes that they've already filed them or 2018 if they haven't. You receive them automatically beginning about April 17th. You receive up to $1,200 for an individual and $2,400 for a married couple. Parents will also receive $500 for each child, 17 and under. And I understand that people have 18 year old children to live with them. I have one. Uh, some decisions had to be made of, uh, on this in terms of what we could and couldn't do. And in many cases, 18 year old number of them are their own taxes and they would be eligible for a check. Question is who's eligible? Individuals eligible for if they have income of 70, uh, up to $75,000. Uh, married couples are eligible for an income up to $150,000 for full payment. Above those amounts, the payments are reduced $5 for every $100 above the threshold, so it phases down. Single filers with income exceeding 99000 or 198000 for joint filers with no children are not eligible. What it does is it targets the money to people that economically need the money most and not to those that are, frankly, better off. The question I've asked is, how do, how do I know the IRS will know where to send my payment? I, I'd laugh and tell you the IRS can always find you, but maybe today's not a good day to laugh. The vast majority of uh, people do not need to take any action. If you filed your taxes, if you uh, last year or this year, they know where to send this payment to. For people that have not filed their taxes, uh, we're going to get into that a little further, but uh, you'll need to file a short form on the tax return. Now, the other thing is if you get Social Security tax checks, they will be sent automatically. If you get Social Security disability checks, you'll get your payment automatically. They're, they're taking that information and sending out those payments. question was about the IRS does not have my direct deposit information. What can I do about that? Uh, shortly, and I think it may happen even this week, uh, it was originally said to take a couple of weeks, the IRS will develop a web-based portal for you to go if you do not have direct deposit to provide banking information to the IRS online so individuals can receive payments immediately as opposed to checks in the mail. Now, in saying that, I can't stress enough, you need to go directly to the IRS, irs.gov slash coronavirus. You need to be very, pay very much attention to where you go and what information you give so that you don't get scammed. And unfortunately, in the current environment, there's a lot of scams out there in case you hadn't noticed. Um, another question, I'm not typically required to file a tax return. Can I still receive my payment? Absolutely. What you, tip, what you need to do is you'll need to file a, um, a simple tax return uh, you can do it electronically to, in order to see the income pa impact payment. It uh, doesn't mean you're going to owe tax, but you need to fill out a simple return so, in fact, they know you're, you're there, they know where you live, and then you can go put in your direct deposit uh, information in the portal if you want to. Social Security recipients, some veterans, individuals with disabilities who are not otherwise required to file a tax will not owe a tax, but you'll need to uh, file that unless you're getting direct Social Security. Uh, let me see. How can I register the information I needed to, to receive the payment? Uh, IRS.gov slash forward slash coronavirus will allow you to pursue, give your information, allow you to file. Another question we got was, I was calling to I need a bank account number over the phone to make a payment come faster. This is the scam stuff, folks. Well, I can't stress enough. No, the IRS will not call you. No one's going to call you and ask you for your bank account number. No one's going to call you and ask you for your Social Security number. No one's going to call and ask you your, mo your mother's maiden name. Uh, no one will contact you by phone about these payments. No one. I assure you of that. Even if you contacted our office and said, hey, I need help, we'd have to send you a form, a privacy form, in order to, get the inf in order to proceed with information. So these scams are going on on the telephone. They're going on on email. You're seeing stuff come out. Do not respond to those. I can't stress it enough. Do not respond to them. Uh, do what I do. I give them the old keyboard shuffle, make some noise for them because they're irritating me. I get them. You're going to get them, and you can't respond to those. It's going to cause you a problem. Uh, they won't. You know, don't ask them. Don't don't give many information. Don't say if you send them something, you'll get a check. Uh, any of that because you will uh, you will not be happy with the outcome. 
They ask you for your phone, email, text, social security information, uh, that you get it faster if you give them the information that will work for you. There's nothing going to speed this up. There's no other agency that's going to help you get these. I hope that helps. Let's talk a little bit about another component of the CARES Act, which was expanded unemployment compensation. It was recognized, and I was very much adamant of, about we needed to replace the income of people that went to work every day and then ended up that um, suddenly they're out of work. Uh, we, needed to put, we needed to help those people. And there was a lot of discussion around it. We ended up with a program that isn't exactly what I would do, but that happens a lot around Congress. Uh, but what it does do is expands eligibility for unemployment compensation and expands the amount that people can receive. There are many workers under traditional unemployment comp that weren't eligible, self-employed, independent contractors, people they call gig workers. I mean, uh, they weren't originally eligible. They are for assistance under this program. There's significant additional money to reinforce resources the states have. The federal government will pay, uh, right now they put aside $250 billion to provide additional unemployment compensation. It provides additional $600 a week to each UI or pandemic unemployment insurance filed for four months, beginning April 1st through July 31st, 2020. Now, people have asked, well, what if this goes on longer? First, let's, it's hard to predict. Let's hope it doesn't because the economic impact, the impact on your families uh, is significant. If it does, we'll have to deal with that as well as several other things in this program. So rather than put money out there long term uh, is to do it at a point in time as you move forward so it's not, not necessarily that we're going to ignore it. It also provides additional 13 weeks of unemployment to help those who remain unemployed after weeks of state unemployment are exhausted. Are we... Questions have come up about this program. Uh, first, let me one thing. I'm sorry. States with temporary and limited flexibility to hire a temporary staff, rehire former staff, can get help benefits out quickly. So, questions are: If you're self-employed into a contractor, are you eligible under this program? The answer is yes. Now, people said, "Hey, I've gone on the site. I've, I've gotten those questions sent to me, and they said, no, we're not eligible." I think the state. I know the state's working through this because they had to change their systems. So I suggest that uh, you're going to have to employ, you're going to have to apply again subsequently, uh, in order to. Uh, uh, but they will catch up and get to it. It's uh, it's a problem. Last week we had more people file for unemployment compensation in the state of Michigan than filed during the Great Depression. Now, yeah, we're bigger, the population is bigger, but it's also because we have such a massive number of people that were uh, unemployed last week. 330,000 people in Michigan. Um, this also covers laid off workers from churches and religious institutions who otherwise would not be eligible for traditional state programs. Uh, then the questions are, are furloughed workers eligible? And the answer to that is yes. They also receive unemployment benefits. Even if it's part time, they can receive partial benefits. So the objective is to help anybody who's lost income, lost hours off of, uh, as a result of being laid off because of coronavirus. Then the question is, how much do unemployed workers get? Uh, if, you're, if you've dealt with unemployment or dealt with it so far, the reality is what you get is a, is a component of what your earnings were, but we made a change to that in that you're, it's whatever the state eligibility is, plus $600 a week on top of that through July 31, 2020. Frankly, it's to offset, the, it's, to, it's to try to get people as close as possible to what they earned. Now, people have asked, well, in some cases, they get more than what they necessarily made. There was no clean, easy way to do this uh, because there were states saying they couldn't deal with a percentage of, uh, of a, a check and that in their computer system. Unlike many things in government, there is no perfect answer, and not very rarely is it clean. So that's what we went to, and uh, I don't say it's uh, the best answer, but we're trying to keep people whole in a very difficult environment. How long do the benefits last? It varies by state, but most states provide 26 weeks. Michigan does. This provides additional 13 weeks of unemployment should be needed. It expires December 31st. What has not changed, I do want to stress it, is you cannot refuse to stay employed with your employer, to return to work with an employer if they bring you back on a payroll or anything like that. Refusing employment is grounds to have your unemployment compensation ended. And I do want to stress that because it is something that will be uh, enforced by the state, in my opinion, enforced fairly, uh, fairly rigorously, let's put it that way. A um, couple other questions on the unemployment compensation. There were a lot of them that came in. 
Um, <laughs> no matter what time of day I try to get through, the system's crashed. Yeah, uh, the system has been challenged. They're trying to expand it. It's my understanding it's working better at this point than it was later last week, early. Uh, and all I can do is say is keep trying. Uh, they understand. I talk to the governor's staff about this. It's not lost on them. So please just keep trying, and we'll go from there. Uh, well, you also have those uh, those e economic impact payments coming out starting April 17th. A couple other things uh, you need to know about is the uh, paid sick leave program and the paid family leave program. Congress uh, required employers during as a result of this coronavirus pandemic to establish those programs if they did not have them. Certain, certain employers are required to provide up to 80 hours or two full weeks of leave time to any employee as a result of uh, not working because of coronavirus-related reasons. Employers will receive 100% refundable tax credit for that. So yes, they're, they're gonna have to put that in place and pay it, but the federal government will pay it back through their quarterly taxes, and it's refundable. So basically every dime they put out, it comes back to them. That, that tax credit only applies to employers uh, with 500 employees or less. To larger companies, the belief was that they should be able to, to handle it themselves and most have a leave program. We also established a family leave program that employees are required to provide, employers, I'm sorry, 10 weeks of paid family leave should it be needed for child care because their school is closed, child care providers are unavailable due to a public health emergency. And again, that is uh, fully refundable to an employer through their payroll taxes. Federal, state, and local governments are not eligible for that tax credit uh, on that program, in fact, because they largely don't pay taxes. So. I have some questions about that, and I'll go try and go through them quickly and move on to the next thing. Um, my, doesn't, my business doesn't have flexibility or size to provide this benefit, even if I wanted to. Um, first are exemptions for businesses under 50. They can apply for an exemption to the Department of Labor. The United States Department of Labor has on their website, uh, dol.gov agencies. Uh, it's on our website. You can look for it. It's a whole long. I wish it was a shorter URL. It's not. Uh, you can apply for um, that waiver. But I want to stress for small businesses, it is fully refundable. So there's costs in administering it, there, but but you don't have you don't have to sit in the cost for this program. So the extent to which you can, you should take advantage of it. I encourage you to do so. A couple other things to help individuals and small businesses, and businesses entirely, is the delay of tax filing. Let's be honest about it. I mean, this, this has caused some real challenges in getting taxes that required to be filed by April 15th because people can't see tax people, they can't get assistance. Uh, we delayed the tax filing to July 15, 2020. We delayed both the filing and deferred payments until then without penalty interest, regardless of the amount that's owed. The state of Michigan has also moved their tax deadline to July, 20, July 15, 2020, in part because you need your Fed info to file your state info, and the good news is the state figured that out. So those who are able to file their taxes electronically, certainly if you have a refund coming, you should uh, go ahead and file that. You've got money coming, get it, and uh, you certainly do, uh, do need it. So I, I would encourage you to do so. Let me uh, remind you, uh, this has been a longer call, that uh, this is Congressman Paul Mitchell uh, representing Michigan's 10th District, which is northern Macomb County, and the most of the fund. Uh, information about uh, the coronavirus programs is provided and is updated regularly on my website at mitchell.house.gov. And um, I will quickly update some of the provisions for small business that impact uh, many of you in the district as well. What we did in the last component of this bill was to assist with ensuring that we give business every reason to uh, maintain their employment, to maintain their employees on board. Um, the first thing we did was we put in place a payroll protection program. And if you've been watching the news much, what you've seen is a, is a huge uptake of small business for that program. Um, it's limited to employers with five, generally there were 500 employees or less. There are some exceptions to that. I'm not going to get into the nuances. The objective of it is to provide a loan assistance for payroll, mortgage costs or, or rent costs and interest for companies for up to two months. 
the loans can be forgiven if employers maintain their payroll. Back to, to, to numbers that were as of February 15th through the end of uh, through into June. It's a wide variety of things that are covered, but the point of which on this loan is if you maintain your payroll, it's forgiven. Well, what the objective is is to maintain people's connection with their employers, even if they're not working full time, even frankly if they're not working at all, is to maintain them on the payroll, keep them employed with their employer, and give every reason to, so that when this we get through this spike in the coronavirus, when people can go back to work. Businesses can get back and operational as soon as possible. Avoid the delays. Avoid people. Do they have a job? Do they not have a job? Do they have employees or not have employees? Keep them on board with their current employer. So it's forgiveness for up to eight weeks of payroll based on retaining the employees. That forgiveness, by the way, is limited to employees uh, to wages up to $100,000. Anything above that is not covered. Uh, up to 100000 is. But you can, in fact, uh, pursue those. You've got to talk to your banks about it. The, uh, those loans are done through, uh, through banks. Um, the bank you work with, if you're a small business, in all likelihood uh, is able to issue those loans. And the good news, the turnaround has been phenomenally fast on those. Yesterday, uh, uh, my understanding is that the Small Business Administration through the banks issued $32 billion in payroll, uh, paycheck protection program loans, which can turn into grants uh, in the first day of operation, which is uh, nearly as much as they – they do in a year. So it's been a uh, quite an undertaking, and I give credit to uh, the Department of Treasury and the banks for ramping up. Uh, community banks have been particularly helpful in this. So uh, as you look to talk to your banks, uh, talk to your uh, your banker about assistance with this. Uh, the information you need is pretty straightforward. You're going to need your payroll information for last year from your taxes. You're going to need your number of employees on board February 15th. That's simple enough. Uh, so it's, it's pretty simple to, I need to demonstrate you were in business prior to the start of this, uh, as a date prior to the start of this, uh, this little challenge. So, um, that's been an operation on February 15th or prior. So I think that kind of, we can cover all of it because it covers some 501 C3 and, uh, veterans organizations. It does not cover things like at this point in time, with the YWCI, YMCA or chambers of commerce as commerce were not included in that. Is, is what it is. We may change that over time. Another thing is, is as a lot of businesses I've talked with that have uh, small uh, SBA loans under what's called SBA 7A lenders, we put forward that they can defer those loans and have them put on the back of their loans with all interest fees waived so they just re-amortize the loans. The good news is they can get forgiveness for their loans, uh, or not forgiveness, but delay in paying those loans. It makes no sense to take money out of biz, small business to take to the federal government to find a way to give it back. Let's just keep, let them keep their, their loans and stay afloat. So let me see if I can answer a couple of questions here real quickly. Um, most prevalent question is uh, I've gone to my bank and then they aren't offering me any, any information about the loans or the system is down. What should I do? And I talked to a number of businesses, and small business in the community about that. Uh, a persist. B, there are loans being issued under the payroll protection program, and they are deferring loans under the SBA, Small Business 7A. It's happening right now. And your bank should be taking advantage of that and getting in line to do that. Uh, if they have problems with that, they should talk to their contact at SBA through the banker's portal. But um, it's happening. It, yeah, there was some, like, you start up a whole program like this in seven or eight days, it's, it's wild. It, it, people are being assisted, money is being dispersed. And uh, if you're a problem with the bank, I suggest uh, you, you look at another. There are community banks that are willing to look at taking other customers if you're having problems with a particular bank that they're not being very active in terms of doing this. It's an important component of your business, so I encourage you to do that. Um, there's also something called economic disaster loans and grants of up to $10,000 that they should be able to issue within, within about three days. It's called the SBA Economic Injury Disaster Loans. It's ten thousand dollars intended for small business. It's not refund. You don't have to pay it back. Kind of give you an interim until we can get something through the payroll protection program, or the last thing I'll mention, which is the employee re retention tax credit. So far, there hasn't been seen to be as much interest in that, but it is a tax credit to employers, up to fifty percent of their payroll costs if they return if they retain their employees. That's not been something that people have been as uh, advantageous or as interesting um, 
interesting to to them, but it is an option that exists for employers. I think that summarizes. Let me see if I have any more frequently asked questions I can uh, can get into here. I think that covers the questions as well. Let me uh, conclude with a couple of things. I think you're seeing, even in New York and other places, while the things are starting to come to a place that we are going to start to see the other side of this for a while. Uh, New York believes their numbers are, are capping and they'll be at a place they can hopefully see that they're going to subside. Michigan is on the cusp of that, although they did announce today another significant number of deaths, a little over 100 and, 100 and some deaths in the last 24 hours. So it's uh, the challenges continue, and they are, uh, they're they not going to go away for the next uh, week, 10 days, and it's not going to go away entirely. So you have to pay attention to the CDC guidelines on physical distancing and washing your hands and those kinds of things that you think is routine. But I tell you what, I haven't washed my hands and used hand sanitizer as much in my entire life as I had the last three or four weeks. That's going to be a new way of life, uh, paying attention to that. We must do our part to address the health challenge and avoid its effects. The other we have to do is we have to, in my opinion, I've talked to people, uh, Beckman and other shows, we need to maintain a perspective of week to week. People have asked, when is this going to end? I don't know. No one does. But the extent to which we stay focused on keeping ourselves healthy, keeping our families healthy, being concerned about our community, those around us, make sure we keep them healthy. We don't uh, do anything that's going to transmit the virus. Then we are helping our society in more ways. The other is, is the extent to which we look for reasons to work together rather than find reasons to criticize or uh, whatever term you want to put on it. I'll tell you there's plenty of time for all of these assessing, you know, sharing a blame, whatever you want to call it, after this initial phase is over. What we ought to focus on that is what do we do over the summer and in the early fall when we have some risk this is going to come back at some level to prepare for this on our fam for our families, for our communities, and for our nation. And then how do we do, how do we prepare for pandemics in the future as a nation? Because in case we had forgotten, it uh, wasn't that long. It was uh, nine, almost ten years ago we had the swine flu H1N1. Uh, we've had this happen about every 10 years, uh, not as bad as this one. But we need to be better prepared as a nation and as communities than we have been. Uh, and I, we need to think about it from that perspective. How do we keep ourselves safe? I will continue to work with our communities to make sure they have the things they need. I've uh, been doing it every day. And you have my pleasure to continue doing that throughout. If you have questions, uh, you're welcome to, again, uh, go to the website. You can submit it to the website. Please give us your email address so we can respond back or a telephone number. We uh, Responding by mail is really not workable right now. And uh, I wish you and everyone the best as you uh, move forward. If you need assistance, reach out. That's what we're hearing. We work every day. My staff are all working remotely. Uh, they are responding. Um, and I certainly uh, appreciate everyone taking time out of their day to hang in this call. Uh, I hope everyone, I wish everyone well. Have a good day. Bye-bye.